my music cut my music college football peek around the corner we are live we are live welcome welcome everybody special live edition florida state board of trustees versus mecklenburg county atlanta coast conference in mecklenburg county i have no idea what's going on i have absolutely no idea what's going on we had been scrambling. We knew this was going to pop. We knew, and I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, but first of all, let's just get through the first part here. Welcome in to College Football's Peek Around the Corner with your host, Greg Flugar. Um, if we cover college football because we love college football. And if you do as well, please subscribe to our channel. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, smash the like button if you like our content. Share the video with your family and friends. Uh, what else is there? Um, oh, if you want to donate, if you want to support the channel, do a donation. Uh, hit that dollar sign, put a comment in, and we'll get to it as quick as I can. Don't be afraid don't be afraid to be a PATC legend. You are in the studio that sits on the corner of Keith Jackson Parkway and Kurt Gowdy Avenue. You know it all. I Look, we're scrambling. We are absolutely scrambling. I am guilty of everything. Look, um, Justin, the line is open. Give us a call. Justin, 763 2601 Three, three, three. The line is open for Justin. Um, State of North Carolina. I, I'm sorry I can't pop this up any better. They just did that sir reply. Um, they had a deadline of March 18th. We knew it was dropping between 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock Eastern time. It dropped about 24 minutes ago. It took me 24 minutes. I have been gone out of the house, out of the studio, even though we knew it was dropping. Give me a call, Justin. Justin, give me a call because he has had, uh, thank you for everybody showing up. I, I Look, it sounds like the university... Of Virginia's president has an uh, an exhibit in this posting of the Atlantic Coast Conference. I haven't taken a look at it. Let me before here we go. Here we go. Uh, look, everybody. Um, 
Thank you all for coming in. I won't have the time to get to y'all. Thank you for all coming in. Call from Justin. Mr. Justin Lucas is in the house, sir. Hey there, Greg. How you doing, hey there, sir? Greg. I, I appreciate you well. helping me out because first of all, first of all, and you yep. know this better than everybody else, uh, I'm not too bright. Uh, I, 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 even if I even if I had read it, I don't understand it. I know you have right. read some of it. Uh, do you have it up right. on? Do you see it on the screen? Wait, hold on here. Do you see it on my screen or do you have it on your screen? I have it on my screen right over here. I have everything on my screen. Okay. Um, can you, uh, you know what? I just can't pop it that big because it doesn't. Okay. So what are we looking at first? First of all, this is the, the so sir this reply. Is, um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. So um, Florida State filed their motion to dismiss in Mecklenburg County. Yep. Um, the ACC replied to that. FSU replied to that. Yep. And then the judge ordered the ACC to reply to FSU's reply, which is why it's called a sir reply. Got um, it. It yes. gets confusing. Um, so here, um, the, most lawyers that I've spoken to believe that Florida State's strongest argument for dismissing is the, the whole initiation of litigation um, issue um, where they didn't get approval or if they needed approval on December 21. So um, in the exhibits part, um, there's an exhibit from Jim Ryan, the president of Virginia, where he... Um, what page is that on? Um, if you go to here, um, are you on the... I'm on the 17 on where, pages. Um, if you go to, if you see where Sir Reply is, yeah. do you see that? Hit that. If, do, you see the, do you see that plus sign? The X? Yes, the plus sign. Um, if you click on that, there's a, it'll show you the exhibit um, attached. Um, okay, I screwed up. I got to go back. Um, go you know off this no, oh, I'm sorry, the plus sign there. Ooh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so if, if you click that, there's that, these are the attached exhibits that the ACC gave. A, B, um, and gave, C. Correct. So I'm correct. going to exhibit C. A. Yes, see, um, and there, um, a major part of the ACC's original reply was saying, yes, there was consultation with the chair of the board, who is Jim Ryan, um, and he determined that there was no, that this, that the initial lawsuit in December was not material litigation, because the ACC's bylaws state that in order to file an um, material litigation, you need a two-thirds vote. Well, the ACC said that the chair um, said that the ACC did not need the vote. And he, in this, um, I'll just read you what he says. Um, if you go down to three, it says, beginning in August 2023. What, what page are you on now? Uh, one out of four. Which one? Um, page one. I'm on um, number three. Page one, number three, um, if you can see that. Uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I guess I don't really know where you're at. I'm on, I'm on the uh, exhibit C. Yes, you're, you're on the pages. right exhibit. Scroll down a little bit. Number three, number three. Scroll back up. Number three. There's yes, number, number three. three. Yes, um, where it says beginning in August 2023. Did you find it? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, got it, got it, got it, got it. Sorry. Okay, so um, here he says, um, I was aware that Florida State appeared to be either considering a withdrawal from the conference or a challenge to the grant of rights. Um, he further says that in conferring with the management of the conference, a decision was made that the conference would not bring any litigation against Florida State until and only if breach of the agreement, the grant of rights agreement with the conference was believed to be imminent. Discussions with the ACC's management also occurred on whether the conference should bring an action for declaratory relief um, or make affirmative claims for relief. Now, if you remember, the first lawsuit in December was just asking to declare the grant of rights valid. This amended complaint in Mecklenburg asked for damages, um, injunction on Florida State's voting rights. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, 
And he says here that on December 21st, 2023, he was notified that the board of Florida State had scheduled an emergency meeting, um, and he began conferring with the management and council of the ACC, and he, the chair, authorized the filing of a lawsuit that sought only declaratory relief, which was simply asking for the grant of rights to be declared valid. Um, he goes on to say, it was my opinion and the opinion of ACC management that authorization by the board was not required for this lawsuit because it did not constitute the, quote, initiation of material litigation, unquote. The lawsuit sought only to defend and preserve the agreements under which the conference at Florida State had operated and did not seek to change any existing agreements or alter the course or alter the relationship between the conference and Florida State. Um, I'm going to scroll down to number eight now because the rest of that doesn't Yeah, really I, I've got it on number eight right now. This is really <laughs> interesting, number eight. Go ahead yes. and read it. Yes, um, he says that on during the course of the day on December 21st, he consulted with a subset of the president, and the subset were the president of Duke, um, who was the former chair, the immediate past chair, the chancellor of Syracuse, the president of Wake, the president of Virginia Tech and the president of Boston College, Father Leahy. Um, and he was informed that all those members agreed with his interpretation of the bylaws that they did not need a vote to authorize that lawsuit. Um, and, he go, and, he says on the, and he says on December 21st, 2023, that he was of the opinion and still holds the opinion that the lawsuit was authorized to be filed on December 21st, that the lawsuit did not constitute to the initiation of material litigation. Okay, so going on to number 10 now. He says, on January 12th, 2024, I presided over a meeting of the board of directors. Um, and during that meeting, the voting members of the board that were present voted unanimously to approve the filing of the amended complaint, inclusive of the original claims for relief filed on December 21. And he says the vote was unanimous more than the two thirds required for the initiation okay, of the material out. litigation. Time out. Timeout. The yes. fat guy from Minnesota is calling a timeout. Okay. Yes. Now I'm going to talk to you. Ask not a lawyer, but the fat guy from Minnesota. Okay. Yes. Number yes. number one. Uh -huh. We're 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 talking about the University of Virginia's president, who is the co-chair. Okay. He's the chair of the board. He's the chair of the board. I, I, I he, along with, okay, yeah, he's the chair of the board, Jim Phillips. Um, Correct. I've seen him called co-chair, but whatever. Okay, so during the course of December 21st, while the lawsuit was being prepared at my request, this is Jim Ryan talking here. Mm -hmm. The yes, ACC yes. management consulted with, with Duke's president. With with um, with Syracuse Chancellor, with Wake Forest President, with with uh, Virginia Tech's President, and Boston College Father or President or whatever. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, not did, didn't happen to didn't happen to call on um, Clemson, North Carolina, or Miami. Okay, right. Correct. Correct. Number one. Number one. Okay. Number two. On January 12th, 2024. Now, this is the time where the first, um, this was after the initial, right, lawsuit. Correct. But this is the complaint, Correct. right? Yes, this is, um, so January 12th was when the board met to approve the amended complaint. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the amended complaint. The first, the first the first shot across the bow after the initial lawsuit. Correct. Correct. Now, again, people in the chat, I know you're laughing at me, but I'm not talking as a lawyer. I'm just talking as a guy who pretends to be a lawyer and not very well. Okay. So now on January 12, 2024, Virginia's president is presiding over a meeting of the board of directors. Okay. Correct. During that meeting, the voting members of the board that were that were present. Right. I don't know who's present yet. Okay. I'm voted unanimously to approve the filing of the amended complaint, which happened, I believe, on January 12th or right after that. 
Correct. Okay, this unanimous vote was more than the two-thirds required for the initiation of material litigation under the bylaws. So, this unanimous vote that was taken by those who were present, correct. but you know what? There might have been five schools that were not present, correct? Well, no, because um, the ACC's... Um because there's another exhibit in there. Um, it's exhibit A, and it's the email from the commissioner to the board, to all the members of the board. Um, and the email says, so first, you really okay, have wait, to- Okay, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. You're, see, you're a lot quicker and smarter than I am. We've got to- Sorry. Right. We'll, we'll get, I'm, I'm going to flip on that uh, expedition uh, ex exhibit A, but I just so, want to, I, I just, I want to nail something down here. It says- on January 12, 2024, I, Jim Ryan, presided Correct. over a meeting of the board of directors. During that meeting, the voting members of the board that were present, okay, Correct. doesn't mean all Correct. of them. It just means well, you got all the votes that, of the people that were there. Now, let's go, how do I get to, huh? Okay, so first, let me, let me address something. The, in the bylaws of the ACC, there's a thing, there's a thing called an absolute two-thirds two yeah. or an absolute three-fourths. So if you need an absolute three-fourths or an absolute two-thirds, it doesn't matter who shows up. You still need either 10 or 12, yes. even if everyone doesn't show up. Sure. Um, so, so I just wanted to make that sure, clear. Sure, sure, sure. But, 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 um... Right now, I'm looking at the two-thirds scenario here. Uh, Correct. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go. How do I get to uh, Exhibit A? So um, click on Docket. Docket. That, okay, got it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, Exhibit mm -hmm. A. Go ahead and uh, holy smokes. Some so if redaction. you go to Exhibit A, yeah. it's um, Exhibit A is an email from the commissioner of the ACC to the board of to the board of directors, and it looks like he um, CCs or he sends it to the president of Boston College, the president of Clemson, the president of Duke, the president of Georgia Tech, the president of Louisville, Miami, UNC, Berkeley, Stanford. Yeah, Berkeley, Stanford, North Carolina State, um, John Jenkins. I think that's Notre Dame. Um, um, UNC is up there. Gus at email dot UNC is um, that one. Um, so it looks like everyone is. CC'd on this email except um, the president of Florida State. Um, and where's and Miami? What, um, Miami is J. Frank at Miami. Now, um, the, the actual body of the email goes in and says, a special meeting of the board will be held on January 12th at 11 a.m. The meeting will continue the discussion we started on Tuesday regarding a conference legal matter. The SEC Constitution requires a minimum three-day notice to all directors for a special meeting to be held. That notice may be waived by three-fourths, an absolute three-fourths of the directors agreeing to waive the notice requirement or attend the meeting without objection to the notice. Because it is not because it is not known if all directors will be present, please affirmatively reply to this email if you will not attend or are supportive of waiving the notice requirement in this circumstance. So here they're voting by email on whether to waive the three to waive by three fourths of the directors. So you first have to think of this in two steps. First, um, they needed three fourths to waive the requirement of the meeting, to waive the notice of requirement of the meeting. So that's the first part. Yeah. Then after they got over that, they needed the two thirds to initiate litigation. So yeah. it's like a two step process type yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, so that's basically from, that's all that's from there. And the reason why the president of Virginia, the reason why I believe that the, um, that they had the president of Virginia sign this affidavit is because in the ACC's bylaws, um, it is up to the chair in consultation with the commissioner to determine what quote unquote material litigation means. Um, you see what I'm saying? Like yep, whatever yep. the definition of material is, and the president of Virginia is saying, I determined that the initial December 21st lawsuit was not material. Uh, but the amended complaint was material because it asked for 
injunctive relief to stop FSU from voting. It asked for declaratory relief, and it asked for damages. And that, in their view, was material. And what was not material was simply asking for the contract to be validated. Now, Florida State will probably tell you it seems like both of them are material because you're suing another member. That seems pretty material to the conference's purpose. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, um, no, I, I get it. But the ACC is saying, no, that's not the case. Um, couple things here. One is, um, the notice may be waived by three-fourths of the directors agreeing to waive the notice requirement. Correct. Um, I, I Notre Dame is not listed there, are they? Um, isn't John Jenkins the president of Notre Dame? Um, I think he is. I mean, it, or at least it looks like that's trying to say at ND, and I would assume that means okay. Notre Dame. It says okay. John Jenkins. Okay. Stanford, Berkeley, and SMU are in this email. Yes, but they cannot vote. They are not a part of the map here. They, they, they have what's called observational yeah. right yeah. as a yeah. prospective member, yeah. but they cannot vote. And it looks to me like, I know Ben Tario is the deputy commissioner, Brad Hostetter is the deputy commissioner, and Perlin Houck is the, um, is the general counsel for the ACC. Okay. So uh, what, what is the <clears throat> other uh, exhibit? Uh, exhibit um, the e? other exhibit is just what I was, um, um, I just said that um, the bylaws of the ACC ah. talk about who gets to determine what the manual is on a material media rights agreement Got it. is. And the person who gets to determine that is the chair in consultation with the commissioner. Because if you remember in FSC's original complaint, they mentioned that the commissioner of the ACC unilaterally extended the option for ESPN to 2025. You remember that? Yeah. Um, and Florida State argued that's a material matter. That, that should have been voted on by the entire board of directors of the ACC um, because the bylaws state that any material media rights agreement will be voted on by the board, by the entire board. Um, but, the, but the bylaws also directly um, say, and I'm trying to find it here, sorry, I'm trying to read very quickly, um, material media rights agreement. So are you on this, um, are you on Exhibit B? Uh, uh, BS and boy? Yes, BS no. and boy. Okay. Uh no, what what where am I going here? Um, I'm on you, there, but what part? Um um get to exhibit B and go scroll down to the fourth page towards the end of the page and it will be at Q. Q is in quick. Got it. Got it. I got it. I'm on it. Okay, so um here it says it says material media rights agreement shall include any media rights agreement that one provides for an an average annual value equal to or greater than 5% of the conference's aggregate gross revenues during the most recently completed fiscal year, or it could be that otherwise is determined material by the chair or the commissioner or that must be approved by the board pursuant to any media rights policy or resolution adopted by the board. So what the ACC is saying in that number two, where it says that otherwise is deemed material by the chair of the commissioner, they say that the chair of the board did not determine that the amendment was material and therefore the commissioner could unilaterally extend it. Okay. I know it's a lot of legalese and yeah. we're really fighting over the definition of what material is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I appreciate it. Um, is there anything else you want to hit in regards to? Um, let me get out of the exhibits here. I, I'll do. I do want to go back to the um, to the actual filing. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything in here? Um, well, I, I would just say that the um, Florida State is accusing the ACC of what's known as form shopping, which is trying to get a favorable judge. To, um, 
to oversee your case or to hear your case, a judge that you will believe to be favorable. And they accused the agency of when they filed that lawsuit, because usually what happens in lawsuits is the person that files first, not usually, but most of the time, it, 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 there are exceptions and they'll be important whenever I mention them in just a moment. Um, um, usually like the person who files first, that takes priority. But if you file first for the sole purpose of going first to establish a favorable um, form, you no longer have that right to first um, hearing. Um, and, the, and the ACC argues that on page, um, so that you can follow on, this is on page two, um, and it's the second paragraph um, where it says, to try to avoid litigating in a North Carolina court, Florida State creates a world in which the, only the party breaching a contract may file a lawsuit and pick the jurisdiction, and that is somehow mm. not form shopping. So basically, the ACC is accusing Florida State of form shopping themselves. But according to FSU, a party may never protect itself against a breach by filing a declaratory judgment in the place where it lives and where the contract is governed, as that is, quote, form shopping. This heads I win, tells you, tells you lose approach is not and has never been the law. And that's just one part that I find pretty interesting. Um, and then the rest of it is basically about whether the ACC has standing. And that goes back to the question of the vote and the chair of, of determining all that stuff. It's way, way deep down into the legal weeds of whether a party has legal standing, and I don't want to bore you with that. Yeah. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to skim it one more time just to make sure that go I ahead. have seen everything. But And if you have any questions, I'll... You got it. Answer. I appreciate it. So you're going to be in the chat for a while then? Absolutely. I, okay. I appreciate it, Justin. Thanks for the heads up. Thanks for the phone call. Thanks for your uh, patience with me. Um, You're welcome. The hearing is on um, Friday at, at 9.30 a.m. in Charlotte. So on one end of downtown Charlotte, you're going to have the future of a power conference determined. And at the other end of Charlotte, you're going to have the NCAA tournament um, <laughs> going on at the Spectrum Center. Yeah, that's 9.30 <laughs> Eastern time in the morning, Mecklenburg Correct. County. Yep. Right, nine thirty Eastern time. I'm sure there'll be plenty of media outlets there to cover that. We will but. be live here at Peek Around the Corner, <laughs> covering everybody's reporting of it. So, okay, thank you so right. much, sir. I appreciate it. Great call. You're welcome. Hopefully, I provided a fair assessment. See ya. Uh, you did beautiful, sir. Thank you very much. See ya. Bye bye. That beautiful. <laughs> okay. Um, Let me get to uh, let me get to the chat. Um, I'm sort of narrowing down my focus <clears throat> on exhibit whatever that first <laughs> exhibit we looked at. I'll go back to it in page three here of the sir reply uh, because honestly. Um, and I'll just read it. And consistent of Florida State's challenge, the ACC showed that its board of directors met on January 12, 2024, that a waiver of a notice in a waiver of process was approved by three-fourths of all directors under the ACC's constitution, And that two-thirds of all directors approved the filing of the amended complaint, including claims for declaratory judgment filed in the initial complaint. Um, is there any way during this, this um, discovery back and forth is there any way for anybody, especially Florida State, to figure out who voted? Where is the record? Who voted? Who was the two-thirds? Who was the ten members that voted for this? Um, at least ten members who voted for this. And were there... Were there Four other members, besides Notre Dame, take Notre Dame out of the picture, 
Was there a, um, now obviously Florida State did not vote for it. Was there a North Carolina, Clemson, Miami grouping that did not vote for uh, to give approval to the ACC for filing the, the amended complaint on January 12th, 2024? That is something, um, that is something that I am, I, I'm, I'm very interested. Can we, can we find that out? Adam onto barrels. Thank you so much for becoming an early P cloak and dagger member. Once again, holy smokes. I appreciate it. You are hereby cloak and dagger knighted again. Thank you, Adam Red Raider, for your generosity to the program. Okay. Um, there is a lot going on here. I'm just going to try to catch up. The phone lines are open. 763 763-260-1333-763-260-1333. One, three, three, three. Give us a call. Um, is Doug Rohan in the in the in the house? He can give us a call. Jen Noel. Uh Doug, if you want to give us a call, go ahead. 763-260-1333. Um, earlier in the day, we got the heads up that this was happening. Um, so we stood by, I gave everybody a warning. I gave everybody a warning. Here is Doug. Thank goodness. Call from Rohan. Mr. Rohan, thanks for calling, sir. I appreciate it. I'm just giving you a warning. You're talking to the fat guy from Minnesota. I'm not as, I'm not as bright as the other hosts that you normally talk to. So what do you think about this? No, you guys are doing a great job. In fact, I was really impressed with Justin. I think he did a good job breaking it down. I wanted to get more information about him to send him my, my thoughts and the thank yous that he uh, was jumping on this early and was saying everything that, that seemed right so far. Do you have any extended thoughts on this? Um, my question would be, are we ever going to find out who were the two-thirds that voted for the amended complaint? The two-third members? Oh, I definitely think I definitely think we will find out eventually. I don't know when we will find out, okay. uh, but that's all that information is eventually going to be made public, and um, you know it's, it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, if I was one of the four other members that didn't get asked, and I'm not FSU, I, I would be one of the ones thinking, okay, I, I do confirm my decision of leaving this conference as being the right thing. If I'm not going to be allowed inside the sandbox to play when the stuff is hitting the fan, then uh, clearly you've just helped reinforce what I already thought was happening, which is that I'm not welcome here. Yeah, but and, and, and the two that are firmly in the sandbox is Virginia and Virginia Tech, one of them being uh, the president who is the chair of the culture. I'm not sure what, mm -hmm. I thought he was the culture, but maybe he's the chair but whatever, he's in this sandbox, right? How yeah, is that was my understanding? Yeah. So I mean, um, and and his name was on the very first, I don't know what you would call it, communication coming out of ACC Commissioner's Jim Phillips' office right after Florida State did what they did on December twenty second, two thousand twenty three, in the Board of Trustees meeting when Jim Phillips put out that communication. James Ryan's name and signature was on that as well so right. i don't know if james ryan is tying up virginia here um i don't know if he's putting handcuffs on his university i'm not sure it is interesting because they were of course one of the ones that were considered to be uh going to the big 10 maybe but uh that's that's going to be curious to see how this shakes out but you're asking about you know other thoughts and other other impressions i was looking down through this pleading at the section where uh the cases that were being cited dealt with uh 
defining the material litigation. And I just wanted to make sure that your listeners understood that, you know, this is one of those issues of statutory construction. We just had a Supreme Court decision come out today where somebody is going to spend an extra 15 years in jail because of how the courts interpreted the word and. So here we have a paragraph on page eight where the they're now trying to parse. And what happens is we create these contracts, we create these deals, we have all these discussions, and then seven, 12, 15 years later, we're having all this litigation, breaking down all of these paragraphs and words, never having even thought about these being issues. So here, specifically, they're talking about material litigation, and the ACC is trying to make a that, oh, the two cases that FSU cites to had something to do with all litigation being required, you know, requiring a vote, or specific litigation against specific parties requiring a vote. Here, they just said material litigation, and we didn't know, you know, what the material litigation was, but material clearly qualifies litigation. That's BS. Material litigation is just, what, the opposite of immaterial litigation? Why would we have immaterial litigation? So this is just somebody that was being paid by the word or some English major like myself that became a lawyer, and we like to use words, and we like to spread things out. We like to qualify things. So we put in the term material litigation instead of just litigation. So it really is nonsense, but um, I, I understand why the attorneys are getting paid big bucks on both sides right now yeah. to unpack and, and look at each d possible argument. And here, somebody using the word material litigation has opened up a huge chapter in what, in fact, did the parties mean and what did they intend when they signed this contract. Okay, uh, Doug, um, now we, we knew that there was a uh, March 18th deadline, um, I guess you call it a sure reply. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so so it's a tennis match. We, the ball has volleyed four different times over the net, right? Correct. So, um, and I think, I believe Judge Cooper kind of said, right, this is a deadline, March 18th, he's talking to the AC side of it, right? So Correct. We we should again I could I probably am completely wrong, Mr. Rohan, but we probably <laughs> shouldn't expect any more volleys over the net before the March twenty second, correct or am I incorrect? We have we have seven more minutes until the close of business. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? I mean, that's, you know, at, at the end of the day, both parties are really just trying to get in the last word. Both parties yeah. want to make it a point. And that's why I was talking to some people about the hearing on Friday. It's going to be anticlimactic. Mm -hmm. First, we're not going to get a decision that day. The judge isn't going to rule from yeah. the bench. I would suspect, I would hope it's a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday of the following week. But the second thing is that people are putting out like this extensive two page analysis of one case that FSU cited. That's the kind of stuff that has to to be put in writing because you don't get up in front of a judge and speak for 30 minutes, half an, you know, an hour and have him recall salient details that are technical like that. So you put all this stuff in the briefs, the judge has more than enough written material to base his decision on, and the parties are just going to get up and hit a few high points, maybe shore up a few things. The judge may have some questions in case anybody has seen you know, these court of appeals decisions or the Supreme Court decisions where they ask questions from the bench. The hearing gives the judge to ask those questions as well. Maybe there's even supplemental briefs that are due on Monday afternoon or something like that. So there can still be some more steps in this process, but it's just been fascinating to watch and I'm glad that everybody is getting an opportunity to to learn the law when it relates to an issue that interests them and intrigues them so um, so isn't there like okay so the judge is presiding over this on Friday and let's just say I, I have no I, I have no idea how it works Doug but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna guess so He's writing some notes up. He, he's 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 getting an angle on this. Doesn't he have to like have somebody in his staff review his accuracy? Not accuracy. I don't know what the word is. But he's got a staff attorney. He he does yeah. have staff. There are people back back there that are double checking and making sure the cases that are cited are yeah, real yeah, cases yeah. and not AI generated uh, points. Uh, but yeah. go on with what you're saying. So, so that might take a day or two. Um, so we're probably 
might not know the result of this no earlier than next Wednesday, right? That would be my suspicion. Okay. All right. That's that's what I figured. Um, well, is there anything you want to add, Mr. Rohan? Is it uh, is there anything else in this you've looked at that you kind of interest you from either the Florida State side or the ACC side of it? That's really all I've had time to look at so far. I mean, we did talk about ACC does talk about FSU's changing strategy and changing arguments. Both sides have done that plenty. That's yes. what happens when you file a complaint and then an amended complaint. Yes. People do narrow in their strategies, think of other thoughts. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very inch, uh, Again, we're going to be following this. Uh, I appreciate it, Doug, for your call. Uh, might have to call in you again to bail me out of something here. But I do appreciate your time and consideration, sir. My pleasure, Greg. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you. Beautiful. Nice. Absolutely beautiful. Holy smokes. Uh, Mr. Doug Rohan, lawyer. Um, I believe he's out of the great state of Georgia. In the Atlanta area, Florida State alum. But uh, practicing out of out of Georgia, I believe Atlanta, Georgia. Beautiful call. Thank you so much. Let's get some uh, more phone calls. Seven six three two six zero one three three three. I do want to get back into um, this James Ryan. I don't know. Um, Look, we talked about it where politically, and it's not just from the attorney general, um, not from the just the attorney general of Virginia, but the Virginia in Virginia Tech is entangled. Um, they're they um, in our holy smokes theater. They are not. On stage, they're not in the first row. They're back in the 10th row for good reason. Uh, it's been like that for months. You, you, you're kind of seeing it play out here. Uh, uh, Rohan uses the term sandbox. They're in the sandbox with Boston College, with Wake Forest, with Duke. But um, they're not out there with Oregon, uh, Oregon, Clemson, North Carolina. you kind of seeing it play out. I want to um, again. I just want to point this out. On page on Exhibit C, James Ryan, on January twelfth, two thousand twenty-four. Call from. Ryan Thomas. Ryan Thomas, can you hold one second, sir? Go ahead, Greg. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Just um, again, um, this is James Ryan, President of Virginia. On January 12, 2024, I presided over a meeting of the Board of Directors. During that meeting, the voting members of the board that were present voted unanimously to approve the filing of the amended complaint inclusive of the original claims really filed on December 21st, 2023. So they got to two thirds. Okay. It was unanimous, but we don't know how, how many was at the meeting to vote. It could have been just the 10, not including Florida state, obviously not including Miami, Clemson, North Carolina, who knows about Notre Dame. Ryan Thomas, the floor is yours. What do you think? Have you been able to look at this at all? I ha I have not. I've been uh, doing with far more pressing paperwork, Greg, in Got my it. NCAA yeah. bracket. But Got I know it. this is a college football show, so yes. we'll, we'll not delve into that. But th th that has been the, the documents that I've been going through and reviewing, you know, making sure I get my NCAA brackets filed on time with the uh, office pool court. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's sort of interesting to put two and two together here, um, Greg, and 
I just want to kind of explain and, and kind of hit on a couple things for people to understand. Um, you know, Immaculate has, has been guiding me through as like you, I've been trying to scratch, I've been scratching my head on Notre Dame and, you know, what are they thinking? And, you know, are they, you know, are, are they going to actually pop in on the stage? But, um, you know, looking at this, I want people to kind of understand a couple of things with the SEC and expansion. Um, now, the SEC does have a pro rata clause in their ESPN contract. That is there. Um, now, I want people to read between the lines here. Um, Chris Del Conte, even though there isn't a, a there, even though there isn't a um, an agreement yet to go to nine games to the SEC. It's interesting that Texas's AD thinks that they will go to that by yeah. 2026. And I want people to put that together, that that additional game for those additional members right there provides the content ESPN needs necessary to pay pro rata for, you know, an expansion to probably add four teams or something. And um, so that that's one thing I want people to keep in mind is, is that. The second thing people need to keep in mind is this that given the, AC, uh, the, the, the ACC's current media money and the projected FCC current media money, and this is, this is, just, this is before the playoffs or anything, it's, it's, it's double that of the, of the ACC's te, uh, television contract, meaning that if an ACC team came in to the SEC at 50%, they would be making just as much as the ACC for the duration as they would be in the ACC for the duration of their their media contract until 2032. Um, and if you take that those four teams and 50 percent, um, that adds up to about 7.5 million additional money uh, per SEC school, the 16 that are there now that would go to them and would close the nine million dollar gap that they have with the Big Ten in per school media re revenue. So I, I want people to kind of think right there, the incentive that is there for the SEC to add four. Now, the, the, the question is, is how do they crack the, you know, this is kind of how do they crack the waster? Uh, same, same issue we had with the Pac-10 last year, or Pac-12 last year, you know, who, who cracks the waster first or the clam first before others get in? And, you know, people need to understand that Clemson and FSU probably represent 50% of the football value of the ACC network and the ACC TV deal in general. And losing those two, um, you know, I know Virginia and Virginia Tech, you know, they say that they're tied together. And I know the UNC Board of Governors have mm. taken the realignment decision to themselves. But if the ACC loses FSU and Clemson, um, ESPN is going to probably either not renew that option or it's going to be a significantly discounted amount. So when these board of regents or even the governor or the attorney general of Virginia looks at this at the total dollars, they're not going to sit there and keep both teams in the ACC at half of what they're making <laughs> when you know there's a good chance that you know, at least one of them can go to the SEC or Big Ten and make, you know, the same money they're getting now while another goes to the Big 12 and make the same money they're getting now and basically be no worse off than they are now. And I, I, I think sometimes that this, uh, this whole thing of being tied together, um, like you said with UNC, they got to look at the numbers and they got to, you know, the financial plan will make sense. But I can tell you right now, a impaired ACC contract makes less sense <laughs> than splitting the teams up. And, um, you know, so I think that, you know, this is going to unfold interesting enough. And I think people are jockeying for, you know, people are jockeying for what they, what they can get and who, who can impress what. Um, I thought Greg Sankey's NCAA basketball tournament questions or comments were kind of interesting to me, but, um, you know, I, I will say this, and I will drive everyone crazy here on PATC, uh, but I think that at UNC and Clemson, you know, in, in addition to those of being potential targets for the SEC, uh, I would not rule out Duke. And I say that because that's the most valuable college basketball rivalry 
you go to nine SEC games and you don't have a mid-November cupcake, someone needs a win. And, uh, you know, the academic research connections mean something to those SEC presidents. Yeah. Just putting that out there. Just putting okay. that out there, folks. Okay. But anyway, with that, Greg, this should be uh, this should be fun. But, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, people may have their public position, but like you said, you know, lo, lo, the, the cloak and dagger theater, the PATC uh, theater right now, is uh, playing Julius Caesar, and there are plenty of knives pulled out, ready to spring. So uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, uh, take care, Greg. Great job with the show, and uh, keep it, keep keep doing the good work, my friend. Appreciate it. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you, Brian. No problem. Um, we've got breaking news. Breaking news. Break. Breaking news. We'll get back to the Florida State ACC. Dartmouth has informed council for the SEIU Local 560 that the school will decline their demand and negotiate. Full statement from the university, which is appealing the Na- Na- National Labor Relations Board Regional Director's decision, the basketball players being deemed employees. Everybody hang on for one second. Call from... Immaculate. Immaculate. Can you just hold on? I'm just going to read this Dartmouth thing here, okay? Yeah, of course. I just appreciate- heard breaking news. I thought I was supposed to call in. <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Boy, I've been scrambling. I'm, I'm out of it here. Okay. Given Dartmouth decades-long commitment to athletics as an extension to our academic mission again, this is Dartmouth saying that they are not going to negotiate with the local union, SEIU Local 560. Given Dartmouth's decades-long commitment to athletics as an extension of our academic mission, we believe the regional director has made an extraordinary mistake in finding these students are employees. Varsity athletes in the Ivy League are not employees. They are students whose educational program includes athletics. The Ivy League was formed in 1954 with a commitment to the primacy of academics, which was visionary at the time and even more so today. While we continue to negotiate in good faith with multiple unions representing Dartmouth employees of the university, our responsibility to future generation of students mean we must explore all our legal options for challenging the regional director's legal air. We are doing so on two tracks. We are appealing the regional director's decision to the full NLRB as contrary to every legal precedent. From a procedural standpoint, if the full NLRB refuses to overturn the regional director's decisions, Dartmouth's only option is to challenge this legal error is to engage in a technical refusal to bargain. An unprecedented step in our long history of labor negotiations this will likely result in SEIU Local 560 filing an unfair labor practice charge with NLRB, which we would appeal. This is the, this is the only lever Dartmouth has to get this matter reviewed by a federal court. Manny Macklett, I'm telling you, Dartmouth, it's either going to be Dartmouth basketball as a club, sport, um... Or nothing at this point. Or, I don't know. Immaculate, go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, I'll, I'll still continue to talk the slightly crazy talk and say, you know, yeah, they could go that direction. They could drop sports. They could do all of that. Entirely possible. And because this looks like they're just buying time. As it's saying, they're, they're trying to get this into federal court. It's buying them time to figure out what they actually want to do. So one of those possibilities, and this goes into the ACC now, which I do believe we're going to see movement here before we even get to football season. Nobody wants to see this thing extend on into next year. they got to figure out next year how they're going to build the CFP. 2026 they're not in any hurry to do it but they still have to do it so you kind of kind of want to know 
who are all the players going to be? What are they going to have? What's their value going to be? So everyone is now going to be pushing the ACC. Get this figured out. I don't care if it's you have everyone sticking behind and you get it figured out or if you're making settlement to, for schools to leave. And at that, that's my opinion here. That's what a lot of these Ivy schools might now be watching and waiting for in order to make up their own decision on which direction they want to go. I mean, if the ACC is not even available to them to come in as a whole, well, then that makes it an easy choice for them. They're going to have to bow out of a lot of sports. That's a 100% call. So there's, there is now a lot of power looking at the ACC to get this figured out very soon. Because as you can see here, Dartmouth is buying time. But the big question is, what are they buying time for, Greg? I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, they, I, I don't know. Remember, remember back in the, when we were talking about the pack a lot. Yeah. I was like, watch what's going on on the ACC. Yeah. I, and you, I, like, I yeah. know, crazy, crazy talk, but here we are. Yeah. And I'm I, saying, I, I honestly believe we are going to see that rise up in the discussion points and you're going to start to see leaks come out and things of the same nature about how we kind of got rolling into the ACC. Um, they're going to have to do something, you know. They well, either or, give up or they don't or have they to, move to or a place they where they can make something, money. or they don't but have that, to do something, or they don't have to what, do something. They they don't have. But to that do is basketball. doing something, huh? That is doing something. No, like, I that dropping is, but, sports is doing something. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, that's what I mean. Like I don't mean like they have. Yeah, to, they have to go. They ne- just can't stay where they are. Nebraska nil. The state of Nebraska. Uh, Bill passes first of three votes, 29 to nothing. It's going through the Nebraska legislature. And it says universities can guide athletes at NIL. Staff and coaches mm-hmm. can't be sued based on NIL. Athletes, not employees. So the state of Nebraska is going to be, once this passes through everything, um, they don't want their athletes to be employees. So I don't know. It's... And that USC case? Yeah. I mean, I put in something on that, too. And that I see the USC case kind of similar to the Northwestern case of 2014. I mean, everyone's kind of assuming it's, you know, the NLRB case is going to, you know, USC will lose it, which probably will, just like Northwestern lost their first case. They went through an appeal process, just like we're seeing with Dartmouth. I think USC is going to do the same thing. And USC, unlike Dartmouth, they can actually make the exact same defense argument in that appeal as Northwestern did. So everyone's kind of saying that this USC thing is a sure thing. And I don't know, I I don't want to go at lawyers as if I know more than them, but just looking back at history at a a very similar case and how that played out, I would look at that and say, we, we can't discount the possibility of that. So I would say for folks who are interested in that, Kind of look up the Northwestern NLRB case of 2014 and how that went. Because what they ended up getting away with is that their membership in the Big Ten Conference and all those powerful public schools and all the money that they have, for them to remain competitive in that conference, it was not viable for them to have to um, be held to a different standard than all of those schools. Well, guess what? USD is now part of that same conference with those same schools, even more of them. So I, I tend to think that it's just as likely that USC gets the Northwestern treatment, whereas Dartmouth will not. They do not have that same defense. So to me, the, the big case to follow it on this is still Dartmouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> no, what do you, uh, have you been able to, uh, did you listen to uh, Doug Rohan and, and <clears throat> have, have I, you I been able to read over this? Justice. And I think I know Justin from Onyx, and he's very good. Yep. Ron's also very good. Had him on the show, and he's yep. been he's been around. He's very polished on this, especially when he started going in. He started using the attorney's scalpel, as I call it, because we talk about a lot of this. We can understand some of these things, the business side of it. But, man, when they start to go into the tiny, tiny details, I'm just kind of like, okay, just tell me how it is, Mr. Yeah. Attorney, and I'll take your word on it. But the the part that I stick to, very strongly 
is that the ACC did not take a vote for the initial complaint. That to me is very important because their bylaws say that they're supposed to. And they know that based upon the example of the amended complaint where they did it when they weren't in a time crunch to try and jump ahead of someone. And then, like the caller said, yeah. that's not what like primacy is supposed to be all about. It's not a race to court in order to have favorable yeah. conditions. That's an insult to the court. Like yeah, I, good luck with that court. Now yeah. they're probably at least somewhat insulted by that. I, like, I would oh, think, cause we're I from think the that's the state biggest weakness. Getting, yeah. But that, yeah, I mean, that, that doesn't work that way. Like, yeah, everyone files in your home courts. It's not because you're like, oh, because we're going to get the judgment. No, it's because uh, you live there. It's cheaper for you to go and attend the stuff there, to be a part of it. Your lawyers are probably from your hometown. You don't have to pay them to travel and stay wherever they stay and all those extra uh, fees that they're going to charge you. There's very real and viable reasons to file in your hometown, in the home court, that have nothing to do with having a um, a favorable verdict for for the ACC to go as far as they did in order to try to counter that, they're insulting the court at the same time. So, I, I think that whoever voted for that amended complaint, some of them might have meant it, some of them might have realized what they were doing is giving evidence to the court to show if the ACC not only acted against their bylaws with the first complaint but that they knew better. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's pretty much my position on it. I, uh, I can't go into it like the lawyers do because they have so much more understanding of the oh, details. Yeah. But to me, that, that's the part I stick on it. And, and it, it's just so bad that I don't see why the court even goes beyond that. I think they throw out the initial complaint. And maybe, you know, the best case, they say the amended complaint can become your initial complaint. And, well, now you have to use the filing date of that Second, secondary complaint, which means everything they went to do this for is now lost. So yeah, there's gone. there's no yeah. there's no point for that whole case. They might as well just throw it out. Um, so, anyways, yeah, that's just it. But you know, like I guess that that Dartmouth stuff I think is a bigger deal than most people want to believe yeah. because you know it's the Ivy. We think it they're not part of any of this, and that may not always be the case. So. Anyways, I'm sure you got some other guys who want to jump on. I'm going to head off, but uh, appreciate it. Always good talking to you, Greg. Beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Hawkeye. <laughs> Beautiful call. I'm just going to set the – I got the phone out the hook for just a moment. We've got – I've got to, I got to catch up. I've got to catch up. Um, there's some other stuff I want to get to. Then we'll get back to your phone calls. Florida State ACC Dartmouth case. Uh, Expedition, Greg, thank you so much for your generosity once again. Holy smokes. You are a member for the fourth month. For the fourth month, Cloak and Dagger, Early Peak, a member of the show. You are here by Cloak and Dagger, knighted again. Thank you, Greg. Expedition, Greg. Appreciate it so very much. Carrie. Great show so far, Greg. Good job, Golden Nose. Thank you, Kerry. I appreciate your generosity once again to our channel. Thank you so very much. We scrambled. We got on here as quick as we knew it was coming. I put it out on a tweet at Flug Empire. I told everybody to keep their head on a swivel just in case. Capital C, capital A, capital S, cap. But I, I, I was still caught scrambling here. Um. Thank you so much, Carrie. I do appreciate it. Um, one one thing I want to show here real quick. Hold on, hold on. Ah, so much going on. So much going on. It's unbelievable. Let me get to it. Let me get to it. Man, oh man. Okay, well, I lost it. So now I got to go this way. Sorry, everybody. Here we go. Um, big news. Um, Kalen DeBoer. Holy smokes. Alabama coach from Washington. Pac-12 championship last year. Went to the championship game against Michigan. Kalen DeBoer has agreed to an eight-year contract. 
worth 10 million in 2024. It will increase annually up to 11.75 million in the final year. If he gets to his eighth year, if he's going to be making way more than 11.75 because that's going to get jacked up over and over and over again. It's the first year making 10 million first year out of the gate, Alabama, Crimson Tide did not go cheap. Kalen DeBoer, wow. Okay, let me get through this real quick. We, I, we, Every time we do a live show, we do a spotlight, right? We spotlight a team for the 2024 season. We've been going through a lot of them. Georgia, Indiana, Houston, Ohio State. We've been going right, right, uh, scattershot across the country. It's UCF is UCF is the um, is our spotlight team for March 18th of Monday. UCF, what's going to happen, guys? Second year in the Big 12, third year under Gus Malzone, defensive quarter, defense, new defensive coordinator. Ted Roof is coming in from Oklahoma. I don't know. He didn't really do that good good a job at Oklahoma. UCF was 122nd against the rush last year. And they were fourth in the country in running the ball last year. So when you watch a UCF game last year, it was both teams had the ball on the, gr on the ground constantly with big success. Plumlee is gone. They relate, we replaced the quarterback with K.J. Jefferson. Plumlee had a better year than K.J. Jefferson did last year as the quarterback of Arkansas. However, you know, UCF, they're going to have this big old running game, right? R.J. Harvey, over 1,400 yards last year, over six yards per game. He started his career. He's from Orlando area. He started his career as a quarterback at Virginia. He was a Cavalier. Look at pictures. Look at pictures of Harvey when he started his collegiate career to now. Look at the picture. Look at him. They've already, their UCF is already in spring cam. Look at the, he's already been in front of the ca cameras, microphones, answering questions. He is all bulked up. He had an un- Believable year last year. Um, he's gonna. He should be a super. Everybody should know the name, R.J. Harvey. And then you got Johnny Richardson, who keeps year after year producing at such a high level. He averaged over six yards per rush last year. Five hundred, six hundred yards. I don't remember seven hundred yards. So they've got a tandem running backs. They were number fourth in the country last year in rushing yards. West Virginia was number three. Air Force was one or two. I don't remember who was number one. If I think I got those right. Air Force, West Virginia, UCF. K.J. Jefferson, he ran for, I don't know, 400, 500 yards last year. Jefferson as a quarterback. Now he's going to have to... UCS passing game might not be elite once again this year. They lost their best receiver to the NFL draft. Um, they've got uh, Kobe Hudson returning, who caught about 44 passes last year. He's returning. Breedell, Breedell Richardson is a true freshman. High three-star. Breedell Richardson. If you, if you listen to the spring uh, reports coming out of Orlando, he's making play after play. I guess he want, made one spectacular, incredible catch. So look for that true freshman to make an impact. He's They're going to need him. They're going to need him because they lost their best receiver. Their right receiver room isn't all that strong. But UCF's problem last year is they couldn't stop anybody on the run. And Gus Malzone, new defensive coordinator, Ted Roof from Oklahoma, four transfer linebackers, <laughs> and some, some in the secondary, but he, 
He brought in four linebackers. They're all expected to play. Uh, so at the begin at the beginning of the year, watch UCF. They're going to be able to run the ball. Are they going to be able to stop anybody on the ground? Here, peek around the corner. We're going to have about we're going to have UCF maybe finishing in the middle of the Big Twelve Conference. We did Houston. We did a spotlight on Houston a couple of days ago. UCF's going to finish above Houston, but I don't think they're going to be able to contend with West Virginia, Kansas State, Kansas, Oklahoma State, and of course Utah. But six, seven, eight place in the Big Twelve is there. R.J. Harvey. Watch for R.J. Harvey, the big time running back for UCF, and that is our spotlight for UCF. For March 18th, again, tomorrow we're going to be doing another team every day. We're going to be spotlighting the team as we're in spring football and we're getting ready for the 2024 season. Before I open up the phone lines, let me, I'm getting a lot of stuff coming in here. Um, and I just want to make sure. Just want to make sure I've given you the best information as soon as possible. Kalen DeBoer's salary last year at Washington was $4.2 million. This year, $10 million. Wow. Wow. Um, okay. I think... Maybe we'll hit that later on. Phone line. Phone lines are back open. 763-260-1333-763-260-1333. Gus Bus defense doesn't like to stop anyone. Who knew? And they had that great uh, Jason Johnson. But he's gone. I believe he's gone. Uh, he was a he was a, supposed to be the star defensive player last year. He's gone. Um, okay. Jen taking it taking an elbow shot at Miami and North Carolina State. Holy smokes. Call from Crab Cakes and Football. Mr. Terrapin, Crab Cakes and Football hey, how you doing? is on the line. The floor is yours. How are you doing, sir? Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, Caleb DeBoer, $10 million a year after following a legend like uh, Nick Saban. This That's a lot of money. This written all over it. I just don't see it, man. Wow. I just don't – I mean – he, he might make it two, three years. I mean, look how long Texas looked for a good coach after before they finally found Sarkeesian. Look, I mean, all these teams, you know, you just don't go out and find one right after a legend that works. So I just don't think it's going to work. <clears throat> I, think, I think it's going to be a short-lived thing, and they probably should have, you know, invested more time looking for a replacement. I don't think Caleb DeBoer – is going to get it done. That's just my opinion. Yeah. And as for the ACC versus FSU, uh, I I just can't wait for them to just go ahead and settle because I think we all know that's where it's going. Why even put everybody through this? Let's go ahead and settle and get it over with. Well, so, if, if, if the ACC gets a good result in Mecklenburg County, um you know, they might not have the pressure to, to settle anytime soon. Right? But then it'll just go to Florida, and then Florida will give FSU their good result, and it's just going to be, a, you know, a scale with FSU and Florida on one side and ACC and North Carolina on the other, teeter-tottering back and forth. And so until someone comes up and says, this state gets the case, and I don't know who's going to do that. Unless one bows out. So, yeah. I I think it's going to come down to a settlement. 
uh, it has to. I mean, in my opinion, because that is irretrievably broken. I mean, I don't, and still, you know, I'll, I'll wait and see what FSU does behind that. Like you said, all the chalk is Big Ten, but I still have that. Although I know they they pretty much set the gauntlet down when they did the filing. I still have that thought in the back of my brain that they still might have the SEC in mind, but yeah. I still think it might be the Big Ten, though. But, uh, yeah, between DeBoer being overpaid for his first year following behind a legend and them settling just to get it out of the way so we can move on with life and talk about the next steps of, like, when's Notre Dame going to join at that point? Yeah. You know, <laughs> so that's where I'm at. So, all right, man. I'll all let right. you go. I'm in a dead zone area, so I'm getting ready to drop you anyway. So I Got it. Go. Appreciate it. Thanks for the call. All Crab right. cakes, football. Thank Later. you. Um, couple things. Couple things. Uh, did Greg play the air drums? Mr. Monkey says no. We had we had to cut into it. I, I yelled in the microphone, "Cut my music! Cut my music!" Just like Rick Rude used to do. Rick Rude from my hometown, Robbinsdale, Minnesota, northern Minneapolis. Cut my music. Anyways, um, now, so, let's take a step back. Let's take a step back. The Magnificent Seven. Okay. I, I want I want us to talk about this here. Cloak and dagger inside the ACC. Call from JD. JD, uh, can you hold just a moment here? I, I, well, I'm I'm going right into your wheelhouse though, so okay, just okay. just be a little patient with me. All right, I I, I have to. I want to get this out there. I want to let everybody marinate on this, okay? Um, we got the Magnificent Seven, right? We got Florida State, Miami of Florida, North Carolina, North Carolina State, Virginia, Virginia Tech, Clemson, all meeting, going over the possibilities, trying, can we get out of the ground of rights? Can we dissolve the conference per vote? What if we came together, Ross Gellinger, Brett McMurphy broke this news be just the day of the winter meetings of 2000, oh, I don't even know anymore, 2023. Okay, so, I don't know what we're going to call this group, but this is the group, according to President Ryan President of the University of Virginia. These were the schools that he called. These are the schools that he called. Um, you know what? I'm gonna post it. G give me a give me a moment here, um, uh, uh, JD. Give me a moment here. Um, you still with me, sir? Yes, sir. I'm right here. Uh, I, I, appreciate your, I, I appreciate your. I appreciate your. I appreciate your patience, sir. Okay. Oh uh, no, no worries. Okay, so I, I'm going to put up on the board here. We got to come up with the name. This is not the Magnificent Seven. I don't know what we're going to call it, but this was this was today. Exhibit C. That the ACC put out there. During the course of December 21st, the day before, the day before Florida State's Board of Trustees went and said what they said and filed the lawsuit in Leon County, during the course of December 21st, while the lawsuit was being prepared, and at my request, at my request, Virginia's president, ACC management consulted with President the Duke. Syracuse, Wake Forest, Virginia Tech, and Boston College. Okay, so now the Virginia president is the co-chair. 
He's involved in this. Remember, Virginia was part of the Magnificent Seven. Looks like they're part of, you know, he, he, he called on certain schools. He did not call on, of course, he didn't call on Florida State, but he did not call on Clemson. He did not call on North Carolina. Okay, Florida State is at the center of the stage in the Holy Smokes Theater. Clemson's at the edge of it. They're holding hands with North Carolina. Remember, Notre Dame is at the far edge of the stage. They're in the shadow. Who's in the first row? Does anybody remember who's in the first row of the Holy Smokes Theater? North Carolina State and Miami of Florida. Did you notice that, that, that uh, Virginia's president did not call on Miami of Florida or North Carolina State in regards to December 21st, the day before Florida State won the Board of Trustees. I just wanted to point that out. There is a definite delineation. There is a definite line in the sand between Clemson, Florida State at the tip of the spear, Clemson, North Carolina, Miami of Florida, and then Notre Dame's your wild card out there. And then in North Carolina, North Carolina State to be to be um even though they voted for the expansion of the conference. I just wanted to put that out there. JD, I don't know what name we're gonna give Duke, Syracuse, Wake Forest, Virginia Tech, Boston College, Virginia, but it looks like they are a faction within the ACC. JD, the floor is yours. What are you thinking, sir? Hello. I lost him. I lost JD. He had enough. He had enough of the fat guy from Minnesota. The festering five. That works, but there's six of them. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta include Virginia, Virginia, Virginia Tech, Boston College, Wake Forest, Syracuse, and Duke. So the number is six. Call from JD. Call from JD. JD, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, sorry, I accidentally dropped the call. No problem. Uh, no problem. I had one call coming in, and I was trying to end that one. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so it dropped me. Um, well, the other name, um, if Jen Knoll is in the chat, I'm sure her uh, her name for the other group would be the Leftovers. But I don't know. But uh, that's probably not a nice way to to characterize your conference mates. But anyway, it just Sinister is what it is. Six, Anthony Jackson in the chat room. Sinister, Sinister Six. six. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. But um, I, I'm i fascinated by the June 30th date. Okay? June you hear, 30th. Uh, yes, that is when the three new members get admitted to the conference. So that is three pro-ACC votes will, will be in, you know, admitted to the conference. If I was anyone wanting to leave, I would want to avoid that if, if at all possible. Um, you know, there, there's, there's rumors of the quote unquote magnificent seven or part of that group talking earnestly again. Again, you've talked about why that would be hazardous for people to try to dissolve the conference, and I get it, and I'm not saying that's going to happen. And then there's also folks talking about the composition clause is still a factor. Um, yes, it is. What I don't know is there's some disagreement between some people whether or not it's just two or more teams leaving or whether or not you have to fall below a specific number. There's, there's a few disagreements between different groups on which is, which is accurate. Um, but when those three members get into the conference, it doesn't matter. It complicates things for anyone trying to leave. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Yep. So I, I, 
There are some that say that the lawsuits are necessary, but they're not the means on which these schools are going to get out. I think I understand what people are implying. I don't know if that's accurate, but there's a lot of moving pieces here, and there's a lot to suggest that you're not going to have a lack of content over the next few months. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be a lot of days you're going to have two shows a day. And I don't mean it's, it's all the time, but I, I have a feeling there's going to be quite a bit. Um, but yeah, that June 30th date, it just fascinates me at the moment because it just, I don't know. It's, I mean, we're just a little over three months until that hits. Yeah. And yeah. And, and uh, so if if these schools have any way to get out without seeing a lawsuit through or a settlement, if there's another mechanism for that to happen, um, I'm assuming it has to happen by that date. I could be wrong. Um, so you start saying, okay, that's 90 days, and then your head starts to spin like, oh, wow, look at what, what all could happen in 90 days. But anyway... I uh, just didn't know if you'd heard some things similarly or, you know, just. Well, you know what I've heard. Um, even if they dissolve the conference, it doesn't, it doesn't release them from the ground of rights up to, up to t like 2027. So it, it just, it doesn't solve the issue. Uh, it sort of does. Um. Well, I what it have, does, you is, know what I'm. I'm going to have go to ahead. really see it. That, I, I'm not. The reason why Florida State is doing all this in the court is because they got to either beat it or get a settlement. The, the ground sure. of rights. That's why they're doing all this. I don't think there's any other. I don't think there's any part of the board you can move to other than in the court settlement or or beat it. You know. You know, the whole point about um, forcing, um, dissolving the conference or, or, or doing something where multiple teams decide to leave, I think their strategy, if they did that, was ESPN would be forced to void the deal at that point because they're not going to keep the deal. If you have, let's just say, let's just say three or four of your most valuable members just decide we're leaving. I mean, we're leaving ESPN. If that clause is there and there's been enough people to suggest even national, um, national journalists, media members that have suggest that clause is in the contract that ESPN would void the deal and which essentially voids the grant rights because I, the grant rights. I, 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 okay. See, it's one of those things where, man, if it was that easy, they would have already done this. I, I don't think that is, for, for example. Well, I mean, you, for, can, for, wait, you for, can read the, for, go ahead. But for, for, for example, ESPN has to distribute ACC's content. Until 2027. They just have to. Well, well, see, that might be a factor, too. They see, that that they, I don't know. I don't so know if they can they, immediately they, void it or negotiate it, they, they, or if they, if they have to see it to the, turn. The deadline, the deadline is February 1st, 2025, but that deadline is so they don't have to distribute past 2027. So therefore, yes, if they can contract, they have, they have to do the content of ACC, okay? And then even if those seven schools vote to like, um, yeah, well, we can just go around in circles on this. I, Well, you if, know, if, actually if now were, that I, I yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. If, if, I'm just mean. saying if, if, if it was Florida State wouldn't be doing any of this if they thought that that was a pathway out of it that's I, i'll just leave it at that um would you would you would you acknowledge that entities talk behind the scenes 
third person, you know, yada, yada. I mean, there's, I mean, FSU is not doing this unless there's a wink and a nod. So my point is, no, they're not going to force ESPN's hand uh, to to uh, impose the composition clause mm-hmm. if ESPN hasn't acknowledged that yes you can or and I'm not saying any of this is going on yeah. you understand what I mean this is yeah. this is what some people are suggesting could happen and I don't know we've not I mean there's been enough people to say that you know ESPN might want to just redo all these deals again I'm not saying this is the case. Okay, I'm just saying that there's possibilities and there's more than just a few people that have suggested this. And it's not just people on Twitter. There's journalists that have talked about this as a possibility. And I have to actually retrace or or, or go back on what I said. Now, I think I think once the composition clause is invoked by ESPN, I believe that is immediate. They can immediately renegotiate. Uh, from what I understand, having never looked at the contract, mm-hmm. you follow me? I'm just going off of what other people have said. And then another argument that's been raised recently was, what if FSU is able to prove that Jim Phillips didn't have the authority to offer the uh, the option to ESPN to extend? Well, yeah, I think that's I think that's one of Florida State's big parts of their case. Um, yeah, well, uh, well, yeah. well, that is a huge material change yep. to the 2016 agreement. Mm-hmm. That could void the GRR or require a revision to it, which opens the whole thing up again. There's so many different things that are going on, but I, I I'm not saying this yeah. is going to get resolved in the next 90 days. Yeah, but which if any of these, and I'm not going to really call them conspiracy theories because we know they're possibilities, they're far-fetched. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. They're very far-fetched. I think um, the court is the most likely version. But yeah. I mean, before the, last, before the last ACC grant of rights was extended, the, the, the one prior to that, it ended in 2027. Yes, sir. So... And the extended version of the gore is when they put in the uh, the clause, how I understand it, where ESPN could backdoor their way out of, of distributing ACC's content after the 2027 season. So even if yes, all of that was ruled, you know, against... Um, against the ACC, I mean, yeah, against the ACC, I just, again, I don't see, I don't see a, 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 an easy path towards having that ACC grant of rights dissolve before 2027 unless you, you beat them in the courts or you settle, but um, no, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's an uphill climb no yeah, matter what. And, yeah. and, uh, and I'm not certain if the 2016th grant of rights is, is vacated, what does that mean for today? And like you suggest, does that mean the 2013 version is in effect? I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I would have to talk to a lawyer and a lawyer would have to look over it and how much would that cost? You know, wow. Doug Rohan gives all this advice for free, you know, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 you know, a lot of these FSU lawyers, I'm, I'm afraid that one day they're going to send us a bill because uh, uh, I, as much ad- advice as they give, uh, it, I, they've given a lot of pro bono work, you know, for sure. I, you know, Florida State had, Florida State spent a lot of time on this, as you know, JD, before December 22nd, 2023. Um, Clemson has spent a lot of time on this. I just think that whole dissolution, they would have, um, they would have gone down that road long time ago if there was something to it. And I, so, but we shall see. 
should. Yeah, see, that, that's the thing is, is that there's nothing in the ACC contract that gives you the ability to dissolve or in the bylaws to dissolve the conference. It doesn't exist. It they were they were going they were going off some legal theories in the state of by North some Carolina. Indiv- that it could be done. Yeah. And yeah. and that was the reason why nobody's done it yet is because if you try and fail, the repercussions could be severe, severe. Well yeah. you know, more than five hundred million dollars severe. And and that's my commentary, you yeah. know, just from things that I've heard. So it's right. that's that's like the nuclear option, and I don't okay. think it'll ever come to that. Yeah. But anyway, I've been on a right. long time. I Got appreciate it. Appreciate it, it JD, Mr. Seminole. Appreciate it. Have a good Thank evening. You. Beautiful call by JD's PATC, Mr. Seminole. If you're new to the channel or if you haven't done so yet, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the subscribe button and open up your notifications. We can come on live at any time. We knew this was going to happen. We put out a tweet telling y'all something was going to happen. Um, <laughs> uh, this was at 2.11 p.m. Central Time. Keep your head on a swivel this afternoon just in case, C-A-S-E, and then it happened. Um, so you got to subscribe to our channel, smash the like button if you like our content, and make sure you have your notifications on. Call from Rock and Rant. Mr. Hurricane following Mr. Seminole. Holy smokes. The floor is yours hey. now. I rock and rant. According, according to the University of Virginia president, Mr. Ryan, President Ryan, he did not call. He did not call Miami on December 21st to get going on that lawsuit to drop it in Mecklenburg County before Florida State could get on to Leon County. It doesn't look like Miami, Florida is in the Duke, Syracuse, Wake Forest, Boston College, Sandlot. What do you think of all this, sir? Well, from your list and the document's uh, words, to God's ears, right? Um, <laughs> hopefully that's the case. You know, yeah. um, first, this has been a, an awesome show, and I – I appreciate all the lawyers that have called in. You know, yeah. I, as you know, I have some idea of understanding of the contract and a lot of our conversation about the ACC bylaws a few weeks ago actually maps up perfectly to some of the things that came out today. Um, but I do appreciate them, even if they happen to be Florida State lawyers. Um, so thank you to, <laughs> thank you to the community. Um, and the one thing I did want to, one, I'm hoping that's the case, Greg. Uh, we certainly don't know. And I think we had a conversation about we don't, no one really knows anything. Like Miami could have voted different one way. We don't know all that stuff yet. It seems to still be private, but I'm assuming eventually it will come out. So for Florida State's case, I don't really know if their case against the ACC, if it matters who did or didn't approve the legislation, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the lawsuit information or any votes, right? Because ultimately it's about whether the points that Florida State is making are valid or not in terms of grant of rights, the TV contract. Uh, you know, but maybe the validity of the, the countersuit against them comes into play. But I, what, the thing that made me call specifically right at this moment was, I understand what you're saying, um, and this point is already on the screen, so I didn't see that when I called in. Is I'm sure Florida State went down the path of, because we know the lawyers are good, right? At this point, we know that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they went down the path of figuring out conference dissolution, and maybe they went down that path with a Magnificent Seven, it's not clear to me in the bylaws what the dissolution number needs to be to vote the conference out of existence. I've heard There's everything nothing from in the fourth. bylaws. There's absolutely yes, no mention to a, of how to dissolve the conference. But the one thing we do know is there's almost no scenario where dissolution could happen from a minority of the current members voting, right? So if we're at 15 prior to July 1st, yes. they would have had to have had eight. So it's entirely possible that we, and we don't know, right? But it's possible that there are seven votes, but it's immaterial if there was not an eight. 
Because at yeah. a minimum, you would need a simple majority to do that. And that's yeah. probably why they went down the other path. So it's also possible because the ground has moved massively, right, since last May, June, in terms of clarity on what's going on. There's seven or eight points that all the members of the ACC now know in the deal, including not knowing about the option and their future being secured, even at marginal dollars through 2036. There's the Raycom stuff. There's a whole lack of confidence potentially from additional members. There's clarity on the playoff money, at least for 2027 on, and the first round of 2025-26. So I just wouldn't discount, and I haven't, this is just us talking, not because I know something. There are times that I have an idea. But I think it is possible that there is one more moment of a potential dissolution now, do I think that if it's a two-thirds that the current ACC is going to get 10 people to vote it out? I think that's highly unlikely. But it is possible that there are 18, if it's a simple majority, that have a wink and a nod, as the previous caller just mentioned, to a landing place among three options of the Big 12, uh, Big 10, and SEC, whoever you want to put in the, the, the dominoes there. So I think what you're saying is right, but I also think it's possible that there's another path to do it that they explored it they didn't have eight maybe they really needed 10 in which case seven is not 10 they went down the legal suit they now have exposed so much more and maybe there's one last uh, you know grab at that ring while concurrently trying to come to a settlement mm -hmm. one other one other thing that has has changed even a little bit more since you know a year ago is the, the 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 market the media market has tightened even more so look if if a florida state am i uh, florida state clemson north carolina miami florida throw them in there if they get um if you know let's say let's say we use uh jen Knowles number of 175 million 175 million to get out if those four schools, um, after that case, you know, settlement, Florida State 175, they all sit down with SEC and the Big Ten, and they all get the best offer is, uh, you have to, you, you, yeah, we'll grant you an invite, but we're going to, you're going to come in as a discount, like Washington, Oregon. Each one of those schools are still probably going to, Definitely going to pay the one seventy five million to get out, right? Without question, they will. It's a math equation. If if you would guess that's the, on average, you could say by twenty thirty that there's yeah. a seventy five million dollars yes. deficit yeah. between yeah. Big Ten and yeah. Big Ten and SEC plus the playoff allocation. It's yeah. probably more than that because we're not yeah. even factoring in okay. what a renegotiated deal would be. Yeah, but but so so yeah, they would they would all accept it. However. Would a Louisville, would a Pittsburgh, would a Georgia Tech, would a, you know, whatever schools you, you want to put up there, maybe the two to four schools in the ACC, Virginia, Virginia Tech, let's say, because we're only, let's say there's like, let's say there's only four that moves into two to the SEC, two to the Big Ten. Would they pay $175 million to go to the Big 12? You know. What is the, I guess, you know, I don't know whether what the Big 12's pro rata deal is in terms of adding more. You probably have mentioned it a dozen times. It just hasn't stuck with me because it hasn't been my focus. Well, it, it, but if you're. It, it is. A, it is. A, the, even the SEC's pro rata, uh, they might not even. Uh, the SEC might not even force the ESPN to do that. Be or, or let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. The SEC has a pro rata in their new contract that starts July 1st, 2024, okay? But that doesn't mean the schools that are coming in are going to get the money, right? Just right. like Just like California and... Uh, Stanford, there's pro rata money coming. They're getting the, they're not getting it, but the conference is getting the full amount, but it's getting forwarded on to the other Big Twelve schools. Same thing here with right. 
you know, if if uh, if Miami of Florida, if your Hurricanes went to the Big Ten, no, I'm mean, sorry, went to the SEC. The Big Ten doesn't have a pro rata. If they go to the SEC, the SEC schools might say, "Yeah, well, you know, ESPN they gotta they gotta they gotta pay the full freight." But that doesn't mean Miami's getting it all. That means some of it might be going. Yeah, to they could make a deal, and so that you know they're greasing everybody else's yes, deals, and Miami yes, gets. Yes, because and I think there's another mouth to I feed. Think for the, yeah, I think for the Big Twelve conversation for any school, like forget about just make a generic school X from the ACC. I my guess, and we'd have to have somebody do some number crunching, is that. And let's just talk about it from a pure money perspective, because it's not at a certain point when you're talking about a five million dollar difference. It's not really a pure money perspective for a lot of those schools. It could be, you know, academics. It could be culture. It could be a lot of stuff. But from a pure money perspective, I would think that most of them would go because you can already look through a dozen different, you know, studies and resources, blend them all together. Let's just play it out that if it gets to the point that those schools have to consider, am I going to the Big Twelve as X or staying in the ACC? And you already know that your top four brands, which probably in a media rights conversation only represent 40 or 50% of the overall future media value of your deal are going to go away. And therefore a renegotiated deal with a partner like ESPN, should they choose to continue it, you can pretty much do the math of how much more you can best guess your deal would go down relative to the big 12. So I'm guessing that math at a minimum would be a wash and could be a lot more because we still have that variable of the look in on the college football playoff, right? Where they can read the writing on the wall south of um, the Big 12 and north of Washington State and Oregon State and, and the G5 where that playoff dollar amount would probably come. It's probably going to come somewhere north of the G5 for a relatively reconstituted ACC, but far south of probably the Big 12 based off of the you know, ACC potentially pulling up more G5 schools. So I would bet that a lot of those schools who would be borderline in thoughts about moving to the Big 12 would probably go unless there's some sort of cultural or other issue that we're missing. Yeah. All right, Mr. Hurricane, I appreciate the call, man. Yeah, thanks again to everyone who chimed in on the law front to help us out. Beautiful. Great job, sir. Yeah, I, uh, Immaculate, we already saw the paperwork and what private equity accounts Florida State has already done work with 6th Street. Uh, if, if it's $175 million, and let's say Florida State's going to the Big Ten, and they're eventually going to have a slice of the ownership of the network, which is a lot of equity, by the way. Um... And everything else that comes with it. Of course, Florida State's going to have $175 million. You know, SMU raised... Now, I know SMU's got deep pockets, but they raised... When they got to the ACC, when it was official, they raised $100 million like that. If Florida State, if they... if they Look, and another thing, we got to remember this. Jen Noll, let's pretend Jen Noll is the lawyer, okay? And she's sitting across the table with the ACC, and they settle on $175 million. Jen Noll is not going to be writing a $175 million check to the ACC. That's the number that they're going to, you know, okay, that's the settlement. Jen's going to go back, you know, Jen's going to talk to the SEC and and the Big Ten and negotiate and say, look, this is going to cost me $175 million. Is there anything you can do with this? Um, you know, Big Ten, you know, you gave Maryland and Rutgers some really good deals on a loan, like zero interest. Like, like it was nothing for the Big Ten. You're sitting on a big war chest. The Big Ten makes They've got their own slice of the Big Ten network. They own all that sponsorship. The Big Ten is sitting on a boatload of cash. Big Ten, you think you can, uh, you know, can think you can do us a favor and we bring you this, you know, large part of the state of Florida. Florida State's going to have the money. 
The money's not the problem. Equity firm, Big Ten, boosters. That's not the problem. Is getting to the settlement is the issue. And for the ACC, for those who want to have the ACC stick together, stay together, be strong in their negotiations, not even accept a settlement. No, nope, nothing. Then you want this, uh, you want the court case, you want a strong decision by Judge Cooper, right? In Mecklenburg County. You want home field advantage? Maybe you'll get, maybe the ACC will get some good news. Coy, thank you so much for the membership. I do appreciate it. Gifted another membership, Coy, the incredible generosity. For your generosity, Coy, you are once again hereby knighted, cloaked, and dagger. Thank you, Coy, so very much. Unbelievable generosity. Man, Coy has been very generous to myself and to the PATC community. Immaculate has been gifted a member. Mr. Hawkeye, please say thanks. He already did. You're all right, Coy. You're all right. <laughs> Immaculate, you are hereby cloak and dagger knighted. You are now a member of Peek Around the Corner. Gene Watson, Greg, I'm with you. Bank of the Big Ten. Florida State's. The money's not the problem. It's trying to get to force the ACC or for the ACC to feel like they're forced to settle. And the courts can do that and or ESPN can also do that by saying Call we're from. out of here. Jen. Jen, can you hold on just one moment? Okay. Jen, I appreciate it. I'm so happy you you called uh, but I just got a uh, Go Black 45 gifted a membership. Thank you so much, Go Black 45. You are hereby cloak and dagger once again. Thank you for your generosity. Holy smokes, Go Black 45. Who was uh, who was gifted the membership? Ooh, Larry, Larry the GM, Larry the GM. You are hereby cloak and dagger knighted. Thank you so very much. Go watch those early peak episodes. Jen, Noel, Mrs. Seminole, the floor is yours. What are you thinking right now, four days away from March 22nd? So I think this is actually a huge court date. And I agree with uh, Doug Rohan when he called in that it's not going to be decided Friday, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the decision, you know, they have three decisions they can make. They can stay it, they can dismiss it, or they can continue. And I think there, there's one decision that could actually send everything down the tubes and nobody's thinking about this. If Mecklenburg stays this, if they stay it, and you look at what, they have three decisions, so there's a 75% chance that it can be stayed or dismissed, right? Yep. Um, I think it's going to be stayed, and I think that's going to be a huge decision. Explain why. I think it's going to be stayed because I think, the, uh, again, you know, I'm not an attorney. Yep. Um, well, but you're a lot smarter than um, I am, Jen. That's for sure. Yeah. I, well, I don't think so, but yes. I'm just saying I, you know, you look at the arguments, and when the ACC responded with their well, the president of Virginia said it wasn't material. You don't get to decide what's material a judge says. Yeah. Okay? Yes. And a judge is going to look at you running, rushing to the courthouse. You didn't bother to take off your robe, your <laughs> curlers, your face cream, nothing. You were rushing. You had nothing to go on. You just were rushing. You wanted to get there first. And everybody knows that. Yes. I'm sorry, they can pretend any way they want to pretend, but they rushed and they didn't do it. And the reason that it's proven that they knew what they did was wrong is because they then went back and took that vote in January. Yes, January 12th, yes. Yeah. That's 
That's the problem. That's Had they the- not tried the CYA on their own self, yeah. they did it to themselves. They knew what they did was wrong. They tried right. to cover it, and now they're saying, oh, wait, we didn't have to really do it. Yeah. And, 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 and that is so, to me, it's so obvious. Even I can understand it. And if I can understand it, in my mind, if, if, if I, the fat guy from Minnesota, can understand it, it's got to be clear, right? To the, yep. It, it, it's just, it isn't, for me, it's it, not messy. It's not murky. Uh, honestly, they and did I... It they, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I've been saying, has, does anybody watch the show Beat? Veep, no. You watch the show Veep? No. Veep. Oh my gosh, you've got to watch it, honestly. <laughs> the, the ACC seems like it's run like the show Veep. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just an absolute idiot running around. And I mean, she's funny. She's funny. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But my goodness, it's a mess. It's a mess everywhere she goes. It's a mess everything she does. It's a mess, mess everything she says. Her staff's a mess. I've never seen, I mean, are these attorneys, do you think, I honestly see the Florida State attorneys looking at this stuff laughing. Going like, this is fun. This is fun discovery. These are fun yeah. motions we get to file. Well, because they're being so sly and snarky and then back, it's like they seem to be having a good time. It, well, okay, so my question is, um, and I'm going to go back to this, um, back to Exhibit C, James Ryan, number eight. During the course of December 21st, while the lawsuit was being prepared at, at my request, ACC management consulted. Now, who is ACC management? Is that yeah, Jim Phillips? That's and, the, yeah. Okay, Jim Phillips and Ryan consulted with president of the Duke University, Syracuse, Wake Forest, Timothy Sands, Virginia, Virginia Tech, and Boston College. And I was informed that these members agreed with this interpretation of the conference bylaws and the decision to proceed forward with the lawsuit without the full meeting of the board of directors. My, my question is, and I should have, is like, did they meet with any lawyers? Did they, did they, did they, did they meet with, a, is there a gang? There, there's got to be a legal counsel in the ACC. Did they say, look, um, is this the is this okay for us to go in front of the line on the board of trustees without having a vote, or did or did this or did the president of Virginia just say, okay, let let me let me line up a faction here that I know I won't be stepping on any toes, right, Duke? I'm not going to. Well, you know. I'm. I I think you just answered your own question. I think they only contacted him. Maybe they contacted other people, but they didn't add those in, yeah. um, because. You can't sue somebody and break your own bylaws and then complain about it, right? I mean, you just can't. Yeah. They sued their own member before their own member did anything at the end of the day. That is the end of the day. Florida State hadn't done anything yet. Had they uh, scheduled a meeting? Yes. Did everybody know what that meeting was going to say? Probably. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But Florida State legally has to do it that way. And you can't yes. punish somebody legally for doing something legally that they have to do. Yes, yes. Especially a public university that has to do what they did. I mean, there's no other route. Yes. Um, in all honesty, like the ACC could have picked up the phone to Wake and Duke and the rest of the losers and said, hey, <laughs> like vote on this. And they would have done it. They chose not to do that. Yeah, yes. And so, you know, at the end of the day, they still went back and did it in January, and that's their downfall right there. I, I, I would agree. Not that, and the fact to me that Jim Phillips did did not. I don't believe he had the authority to extend the deadline for ESPN to make the call on whether they can pull the plug, right? Well, I mean, I agree with you there. I just think that the full stop on the whole Mecklenburg lawsuit is right there in their own bylaws. Mm-hmm. Um, 
if judges are going to be judges and look at things legally, yeah. then, I mean, they can't unilaterally say this wasn't material when it is material. You can't make a lawsuit material. You can't. You can't unilaterally just say things are, aren't, aren't material because they make you look bad. Yeah. And, um, and to me, that's the whole ACC filing is, hey, whatever makes us look bad isn't material. It's out of the statute of limitations. It's um, too early to do this. I mean, it's, it's all been that. It hasn't been any facts. Yeah. But I, I got a question. Um so when this, do you know if there's going to be a live stream coming out of Mecklenburg County Business Court? Uh, that I don't know. I, know I hope there is. I, yep. I would assume maybe a war chant would do it, but I don't know. Okay. Um, I have not seen any live stream. Uh, we're going to cover it, what we can cover live on Friday ourselves, yeah. like on the Renegade Report, but... Yeah. I um, I don't think uh, I, don't I don't think, think anybody's put out a live version yet because my guess would be the judge is going to wait. He's going to hear the arguments and he's going to then set his decision for maybe a Monday or Tuesday, unless he hears enough that day. And I would assume that's not going to be the case, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jen. I appreciate the phone call. Oh, of course. I, I appreciate you uh, instructing me once again. This is, you know, this is way above my uh, pay grade, Jen, okay? Oh, it's way above mine, too. So Don't I, feel bad. It's way above mine, too. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, um, to me, if I were you, go watch V. Enjoy your week. <laughs> Go home, sit down, watch me. It'll be extremely entertaining, and it'll tell you how the ACC's run. I'm just letting you know. Got it. Okay. Y'all in the chat, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, what, but I'm telling you right now. Is is that, is, what, 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 like? It's, it, it's HBO Max, and okay. it's uh, Elaine from Seinfeld plays Got the it. vice president of the United States. Got it is so funny. Got it. All righty. Y'all go watch it. I'm telling you right now, it'll show you Jim Phillips and the ACC. All right. Appreciate it, Jen. Thank you so very much. All right, y'all have a good one. Yeah, great Bye. call, Mrs. Seminole. Whoops, whoops, I got the wrong music on. I'm sorry, Mrs. Seminole. Holy smokes. Boy, I'm screwing up all over the place. Mm. Man, we've had, uh, we've had some callers. Holy smokes. Doug Rohan, Ryan Thomas, Immaculate Jen, JD, Crab Cakes and Football. Oh, everybody. Everybody who's called has been unbelievable. Great call, Jen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even the Buckeye. Even a Buckeye is saying great call to Mrs. Seminole. Okay, let me see if there's anything... Um, Let me see if there's anything that I missed here. We got the Dartmouth case we talked about. We've talked about UCF. That was our spotlight team of the day here, March 18th. Great running game. Johnny Richardson, RJ Harley, great running game. UCF, fourth in the country last year. They couldn't stop the run. They could not stop the run. They could run. But they could not stop it. Four new linebackers out of the portal. I don't know. Uh, Breedale Richardson, a three-star, high three-star wide receiver. He's turning some heads in camp. It looks like he's going to be playing a lot. He's going to be getting a lot of snaps as a true freshman. Our UCF spotlight, that was our team for today. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. We'll see. We shall see. Um, and then if you've missed it, go to North Carolina Business Court Public Access. I did provide a link in the description. 
we knew it was popping or we had a good idea it was popping today. Uh, we knew that the deadline was today, March 18th. It was going to pop between 3 and 5 Eastern time. It popped 3.57 East. Was it 3.57 Eastern time? I think it was. I think it was 3.57 Eastern time. And it took, it still took us 22 minutes to get this show going. Um, but anyways, we do provide a link. You can go take a look at that. I do appreciate everybody's incredible generosity, all the donations and gift memberships. Holy smokes. Look at this. Stephen McNeely, an early peak member for the fourth month. How will CFP distribution change if the ACC collapses? First of all, let me thank you once again for being an early peak member. Four months in a row. Holy smokes, you are here by Cloak and Dagger Knighted, Mr. McNeely. You know what? I don't know. I don't know, Steve. It depends on who leaves, who stays, if it collapses. But I do know this. I do agree with the Immaculate. I think what you see with the distribution rights basically lines up with the voting uh, weights. If you if you combine now, this is if you want to categor, categorize this as speculation, it is, but. I think if you line up the voting weights of the SEC and the Big Ten, combine those two together, it's going to be around 58%, just like it is with the distribution model. So whenever the SEC and the Big Ten agrees with each other, it's going to pass, whatever it is. If the SEC and the Big Ten don't agree with each other, then they're going to be scrambling for votes with the Big 12 and the ACC and the G5 um, and Notre Dame. I think the voting rights is going to go along with the distribution. Now, so if the ACC collapses, the Big 12 is going to get more of the distribution, more of the votes. But so is the Big Ten and the SEC. And the Big Ten and the SEC are probably going to direct how it exactly is done. But, I, you know, I Brett Yormark has a... We all know that Brett Yormark has a really good relationship with the media partners. So, uh, Big 12's bread will be buttered. Let's put it that way. How much? I don't know. Again, it depends on how many schools leave. Does the ACC stay together with the ACE? I don't know. It's hard to know, Stephen, but great question. But the SEC and the Big Ten will be deciding together on that. That I think we do know. Um, Immaculate, I see it as shares of ownership in a private company. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever the SEC and the Big Ten agree, then that's going to get pushed through. They're not going to agree on everything. I mean, the Big Ten for years have wanted the baseball, uh, the baseball schedule to be delayed. <laughs> they don't want it starting so early for obvious reasons, right? And the SEC says no. ACC. Everybody else basically says no. There, there are going to be issues that the Big Ten and the SEC do not agree with. Uh, so, But when they do, it's a done deal. Uh, Go Black 45, I think the look-in date for 2020 is for 2028. Because Brett Yormark got wind that UNC, Virginia, North Carolina State might not be ready until then to leave the ACC. Then the others will follow. Um, 
the Virginia thing, I'm not even going to talk about the Virginia. The Virginia storyline is of a storyline that is all entangled with, with Virginia Tech. Um, we haven't spent much on it. We, it. There's not much to say. We we don't. They're not even up. They're not on the stage in the Holy Smokes Theater. They're not even in the first nine rows. And you've seen more and more indication why we don't have them up in the front. They're not with Miami. They're not with North Carolina State. And they're not on the stage with North Carolina, Clemson, and Florida State. The North Carolina thing is interesting. Um, I don't know... I'm not saying that North Carolina is ready. Let's say let's say um, that it goes pear shape for the ACC on March 22nd. And we learn about it on the 25th, the 26th, March 27th. Let's say it goes pear shape for the ACC. I expect fireworks to happen. Everybody that we talk to expects fireworks to happen if it goes pear shape for the ACC. The risk is the risk uh, benefit analysis. You saw what North Carolina has done. You saw what the North Carolina Board of Governors have done. They've got their ducks lined up. The Board of Governors. They took a little bit of power away from the Board of Regents at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Mike Gusowicz is out of the way. The Board the board of Regents lean SEC. The Board of Governors lean SEC. I think North Carolina has done a lot to now they understand they have to bring a financial plan to the Board of Governors if they choose to um, change their conference affiliation or start the process. And, you know, North Carolina and the rest of the ACC were just a witness to what happened with the CFP. So that part of it's going to be in their financial plan. I think North Carolina has come some ways down the road. There's a reason why we finally put them up on the stage. They're holding hands with Clemson on the stage. Are they ready to pull the trigger? No, but they're 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 in a different position than they were three months ago. There's clarity. Um, and again, um, and again, it's it it's. I'm gonna put it up on the board here. Just, just, I, I find it interesting. That's all. During the course of December 21st, while the lawsuit was being prepared, and at my request, this is Virginia's president, the ACC management consulted with the president of Duke, Syracuse, Wake Forest, Virginia Tech, Boston College, and I don't see North Carolina State listed. Not North Carolina State. Now all those schools listed there, right? All of those listed in number eight, paragraph eight. They all voted for uh, ACC expansion. North Carolina State voted for ACC expansion. Why wasn't North Carolina State a part of this? 
I, I, maybe there was some, again, this is speculation on my part, but I don't think Jim Ryan woke up on December 21st and heard the news, right? Heard the rumor, saw, saw, I don't think. President Ryan was watching PATC as we broke, as we kept breaking all the Board of Trustees meetings on the Florida State Board of Trustees website. He said, oh my goodness, Florida State's having a meeting December 22nd. Look at the agenda. Look what the fat guy from Minnesota is saying what the agenda is. Ah, legal, uh, illegal, blah, blah, blah about athletics at Florida State. Oh my goodness, we have to react here. December 21st, let me... Uh, let me, where's my Rolodex? Where's my phone? Uh, I'm going to call this president, this president. I don't think so. I think he knew all lined up. They were, they all knew they were, they were going to get a call. There's a faction there. To me, that illustrates a faction. Uh, Virginia and Virginia Tech, maybe... Maybe they have a landing spot in the SEC of the Big Ten, but they know that they're, 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 there's a lot of tanglement between those two universities, and they know they're in back of all these other schools um, because they are watching the Holy Smokes Theater, and they're nowhere near the first row. They're not on the stage. There's a reason for that, because of the chatter that we've been hearing that peek around the corner for months. And it doesn't light up Virginia and Virginia Tech. Not at this point. It could. Possibly could. Very well could. But that's not. That's why they're not on the stage. That's why they're not sitting where Miami and North Carolina State is. And I think this is a good indication why. Uh, we're going to be closing up our live show. I know we still... We still have a big crowd here. Wow. I want to thank you all for joining us today, March 18th. We're going to be covering this story throughout the week. We're going to be doing new spotlight teams every single day, getting ready for the 2024 football season. But we cover everything in college football. Everything. We talk about four transfer linebackers today coming to UCF. We're talking about our R.J. Harvey, the great running back of UCF. We're talking about K.J. Jefferson, the transfer from Arkansas. Going to be the quarterback, QB1 at UCF. But we're also covered like nobody's business, breaking news, breaking news. We had it before anybody else. We popped it up. We had the great Justin Lucas lead us off, gave us a great rundown. I want to say thank you to Mr. Justin Lucas for being an incredible PATC member of this community. Then Doug Rohan, and we had Jen and JD, Immaculate, Crab Cakes for Football, Ryan Thomas. The PATC community is on fire. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to cover everything in college football. But I want to thank the little general, the moderator, the one who rules with an iron fist, my wife, Maria Hernandez Garcia Flugar. I want to thank her for allowing me to do this and to talk college football with you all tonight, today. Keep your head on a swivel. Any breaking news this week, we're coming on live here at Peek Around the Corner. So please stick with us. Thank you for the generous donations. I appreciate it so very much. Thank you for the wonderful chats, comments in the chat room, and the spectacular phone calls once again. From all of us at PATC, to all of you, please, please you all take great care of each other.